I had a class in my doctoral program on exactly the question that you're asking. What's the difference between soul and spirit? Are you familiar with the, the um, story of Narcissus who looked in his reflection and, and couldn't get out of his reflection by the island of Lesbo and ended up in a bunch of pieces on the island ultimately? Okay, so um, that was part of the topic of conversation about this. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Well, soul is, it encompasses, it does not suggest movement, it just is, right? I see the feminine that way. It's just pure love, it's there, period. Spirit suggests movement, right? And so I see spirit more as the dropping into the masculine components of soul, and then the soul itself as just essence itself. So I have a book uh, that was written in the late 1800s. It's called On Sex and Character by a guy named Otto Weininger. And it, it was, it was a, a, a philosophical book, but it was written with some underpinnings of origins of how the body functions. One of the examples would be that in gestation, the hormonal flushes that we have push one gender forward more than the other one, but we're all born with both. Right, and that's not a constant, that that process continually changes. You know, now that was written in the late 1800s and we're just now currently getting more elevated awareness of transgender or the differing terms or people moving through differing genders and what does that mean for us? And so it's taken a hundred, over a hundred years for just that process to go. But also in this book, they wrote about genius. So in, they would talk about women automatically have genius and men have to strive to achieve it. So it's, it's an, it, to me, that reminded me of the conversation of soul versus spirit. We're all both always. We have abilities to dictate the essence of love and the movement of love at the same time, right? Just like the body, we have an accelerator and a brake. Our accelerator, I would say, is spirit, and the brake is fear. They're both vital. We need them both. And we dictate pace of processing based on these emotions. And they are also components of creation, first internal and then external, right? So what does fear do? Let's talk about that because it's such a great internal creator. You know, when we, what happens is it's built into our hardwiring system, our fight, flight, freeze process, right? It's the, it's the flight part. So what happens is this brain, we scan, if we see something that might be what would create a fear process for us, the body will release what's called nitric oxide, which is a naturally made opiate. It causes the body to recoil. They did some studies on this where they would hold infant's hands above a flame and it would automatically pull back. The infant didn't know in, from a flame, but these are the things that are hardwired. It's hardwired in us for survival purposes, right? Well, just as they used the, the, the example in the blog about the guy who, uh, who feared himself to death through freezing, basically, um, the animalistic nature would say that. So yes, in the underpinnings of the reptilian component of that, absolutely. The angelic would say that the person made a selected choice to leave the planet in that moment by, by go, forging ahead to such a degree of fear that they didn't save themselves, thus availing themselves, right? So we have um, Eastern philosophy, we've had it in battles where the kamikaze fighters, or in current days, we've seen it in violent ways. But... So we use it every day in our day-to-day -day life, forms of that, right? Um, so I'm hoping that as we talk about things internally, we can look for the correlation so that it doesn't have to be so amplified in the external for us to, to come to some understanding of why we're doing this. Does that make sense? So for example, Eastern philosophy, there, it's indexical. People define themselves, their self-structure, by how they contribute to the group. That essence is who they are. Here, it's me first, then you, 
right? And as it's always both, what I believe to be true is our alignment goes to the place where we have self-recognition whose ultimate purpose is to contribute to the group. And in that way, we find balance within ourselves, right? Because we've heard cliches, oh, we're only as strong as the weakest link. Well, if we're a collective consciousness, which I believe we are at all times, then trying to get one up on somebody else is actually doing a disservice to all of us, including ourselves, right? That those of us that are coaches and, and in that position where we really want to help other people need to be able to and avail ourselves to come from under the other person for support rather than leading this way or be the change you want to see, right? I believe Gandhi got it right. Exemplify through our own behavior. And I mean all of it willingness to be open and honest, share our deepest, darkest secrets, put, put, them, put them out so that people can take what they need and leave the rest. You know, it's taken me a long time to be able to sit on a phone call openly and publicly and talk about a lot of the things, mental health, alcohol and drug addiction, uh, sexual promiscuity, thinking it was love, you name it, and all of the other things an inability to, to even consider how somebody else feels because I had no ability to understand myself, right? All of these things, when I stood in front of a mirror at 50 years old and looked at myself, it was like, wow, the rest, I, it, I, you know, if I live another 50, I couldn't possibly make up for the, for the trail of, of damage that I did, right? And so, you know, how does one, but I'm going to try, you know, so I avail myself in my life as a living amends, 